by the way, that's one of the great things changing. about having been on vacation for 18 months. I now get to see how much stuff is coming to my house every day. <laughs> I, mean, I tell my wife, like, I got a knock on the door one time, and it was the, uh, it was the uh, Amazon guy, and he was just checking on my wife to see if she was okay because it was two days in a row she went without a package. Boom. Okay, we're live. Well, I'm glad we could uh, we can get this going. You know, you've had a busy couple of days, so I think you know. First elephant in the room is uh, you're back. I'm back. back. <laughs> I'd be yeah, yeah. if I didn't see your LinkedIn post on the press release, and I thought to myself, you know, given you got the basketball background, obviously a, a natural Jordan fan, I would think the press release should have just been the 95 Jordan press release and said, I, I, I was back. thinking a little bit about the Tom Brady. Cause Tom Brady came, well, they both came back and won a championship. When, when uh, Michael Jordan came back, he won another championship and Tom Brady won a Super Bowl. So, you know, I'm taking a look, what the hell, why not? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, okay. We'll dive in. We'll dive into it. I, you know, the normal background stuff. I feel like, let me do, you know, let me dust off the old city analyst, 811 main research and see, I'm going to take a stab at the, uh, the Trauber background and then okay. you fill in the gaps for me for what I'm missing. Okay. So from what I can tell, born in Connecticut, father was an immigrant. So you're, you got that, you're sort of eldest of five, uh, immigrant son mentality or energy. Uh, you sort of moved around all over the place, but graduated, uh, it sounded like uh, high school in Boston. Correct. And you were sort of between two schools uh, for for going undergrad. One was Rice. One was Northwestern. You go visit Chicago, and it's like 30 degrees or something. You go visit Houston. You're like, I, I like this climate a little better. Uh, let, let me get down here. Uh, decide to do undergrad. You play D1 basketball at Rice. Uh, meet your uh, wife there. Uh, you get married shortly after. You do two years at Anderson Consulting, then you end up going back. You, you go to Northwestern, so you go to number two school for your MBA. That's when you start getting into banking, which is, I guess, first Boston now, what, what you would call Credit Suisse, or I guess that's merged now too, but Credit Suisse. Um, and then you try to find your way back to Texas as soon as possible. So how many years are you up in New York? I was up in New York for about one and a half years. Oh, not that long. Okay. Not so that you long. You make it back down to Houston, or it sounded like Dallas. I came, I came down to Dallas first for three years. That was where the opening was. Okay. And then you make your way down to Houston. A couple more years, you move over to Morgan Stanley. And uh, then, then you move over to UBS. Post-financial crisis, UBS is reevaluating how they think about the banking business versus the wealth management business, which was always their core bread and butter, probably still is today. And you move over to City, which is when, you know, call it a couple of years in, that, that's, you know, our, our uh, start of our relationship there. And uh, sort of City powerhouse for 10 years, particularly during... 12 years, 12 and a half years, but close. 12 years. And effectively, we see sort of the rise of all the shale, shale pure plays during that, that time frame. And then, you know, the thought is you're, you're retired, and now, you know, 18 months is sort of long enough for you on the sidelines. <laughs> and now you're back in the game here, here at Mola. So now what, what did I miss? What are, what are we missing? So, so that, was, that was actually pretty good. I'm surprised you had so much of it correct. I think I would just to fill it in, and I'm sure your listeners will already be bored with all of this. Uh, <laughs> my father was an immigrant, but he was also an Olympian swimmer. Yep. I think that's what gave me, uh, when I look back at it, that's what gave me a lot of my competitiveness uh, when I grew up. Uh, you know, he was kind of the, one of these uh, negative reinforcement guys. Nothing sure. was ever enough. And I'd come home from a basketball game and had scored 30 points and done this and that. And he'd ask me about the two free throws I missed. Right. right. And so that's, that's where I got it from. That's, you know, today I think a lot of people think I'm hyper competitive, but I got it from playing sports and I got it from my father growing up. Um, the other thing I, you know, I, I did work at Morgan Stanley in the summer of my two business school years okay. and ultimately decided to go to Credit Suisse. Uh, back then, the first Boston Corporation, interestingly enough, Morgan Stanley wanted me to be in the uh, corporate finance department. I really wanted to be in mergers and acquisitions back right. then. That you know, that's where where it was. So I went to Credit Suisse to be in there. What was at the time one of the preeminent M and A groups on Wall Street, run by Bruce Wasserstein and Joe Perella. 
two two weeks after yep. I accepted my offer from Joe Perella directly, they all they left. They left to go form. <laughs> they started their own deal. <laughs> they started their own firm, and I'm sitting there going, "Now what?" Right? And I had lots of conversations about them. You know, I think they've taken a lot of people. They didn't really want to steal the quote unquote uh, first Boston sure. uh, new hires, even though they've taken everybody else. Took, but, took, took but, everybody else, yeah. <laughs> but I, but I actually still, I went to, I went to First Boston. I worked for a guy by the name of Jim Maher, who was one of the legacy senior M and A guys there. He stayed behind, and I was in the M and A group. And candidly, they needed me really badly because they, they lost everybody. Wow. And I, and I would tell you, I started in August of '88, and that first Thanksgiving there, well, uh, right before that, before that was the RJR deal going on, right? Barbarians at the yep. gate. Yep. And I was one of the first, as you recall, there were three bidders. One of them was First Boston mm-hmm. uh, as, as a bank. They were going to take, take the whole thing uh, uh, private and $25 billion LBO, which at the time was absolutely massive. The yeah. LBO today would still be big. But, uh, and my first assignment, really, was to value the Oreo brand cookies. That, you know, they, they had a <laughs> lot of different brands. As a generalist M&A banker, that was my first job. And I remember... You know, I was one of like three bankers originally put on it, but it, once we really got serious about it, you know, a whole swarm of bankers jumped into it. I remember spending my first Thanksgiving at the office at First Boston. My wife's going, holy cow, what did we get ourselves into? You know, you can't even have Thanksgiving at home. But, uh, you know, that was kind of the, that was kind of the early days. And uh, I did stay there for a couple of years, ultimately decided I was going to move to Texas to really put my wife in a position of we we're going to do this crazy business with mm-hmm. the long hours and lots of travel and put her in an environment. She'd been born and raised in, in Houston, put her back down there. And, and uh, so I went back to Texas, originally first in Dallas, because that was what the opportunity was at Credit Suisse. And then they consolidated their office. They had a very strong uh, Texas office way back in the day. And, um, and then we consolidated it into Houston. They shut the Dallas office. All of a sudden, all of uh, Credit Suisse team, the first Boston team, moves to Merrill Lynch. And two of wow. us had come from Dallas and I was just a vice president at the time. There was a managing director that was there. Was thinking that he was thinking this was the opportunity for him to run the office there. I so he uh, he actually stayed behind. I was getting calls from back then a guy by the name of Rick Gordon and Sam Dotson, who, who were very well known at the time in the energy business, saying, "Look, are you coming to Merrill with us or not? You know, everybody else has left. I'm sitting and trying to figure out if this guy's staying or not because I had come from Dallas with him. And so I ended up going to Merrill Lynch." He ends okay. up, he, my, the guy that I had come down from Dallas to Houston with decides to stay at First Boston. So <laughs> I'm at Merrill Lynch for one day and I go back. And I go back to work with him. I mean, these are crazy days, right? So, so you know, that's, 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 that was there. And then, you know, First Boston had some tough times back then. Um, you, mm-hmm. know, you know, they always had, you know, seemed to have periodically major credit problems and major risk issues. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, you can see what's, what they are today. They had to uh, had to be merged into UBS just to save what they had, and uh, back then they had similar problems. It was called the Bernie mattress uh, deal at the time because it was a big mattress company that had over leveraged, and they ended up uh-huh. holding all the bonds, and it was a very difficult situation for them. Anyway, Morgan Stanley came knocking and said, "We want to open up our first Texas office," and so we all moved over to Morgan Stanley at the time, very strong firm, great firm. And uh, really, we opened up their office and, and hired a bunch of folks and became the, uh, became the energy group for Morgan Stanley at the time. And, um, and so, and then, you know, several years, many years later, uh, when UBS was on the rise, Ken Mollis called and said, hey, uh, we need an energy franchise. And they had picked off several franchises from various mm-hmm. firms, but we needed, we needed a franchise. And uh, so we went over to UBS. I went over to UBS, took the uh, took the team over to UBS, and you know I thought I was going to a bank, a real bank at the time with real lending capabilities, and it turned out it really wasn't. I mean, they had a yeah. little bit more lending than Morgan Stanley had because the energy sector is a very capital intensive business. They need capital. They're a very global business, and I'll come back to why I ended up going over to City. But uh, so I worked for Ken Mollis uh, for almost eight years over at UBS. Then the financial crisis happened, and as yep. you pointed out. Uh, they made the decision to really shrink the investment bank and focus on uh, wealth management. Yep. And, uh, and that was the time when they were going through very difficult times through the financial crisis. Uh, they were, you know, a lot of folks, fortunately I wasn't caught up in it, but a lot of other folks were paid really, really low uh, wages, way low bonuses at the time. I was about to lose my entire team. They were going to mm-hmm. go split to look for a home that would pay them more. They had confidence they could get paid more. 
Mm-hmm. I was fortunate that Ray McGuire, who was running banking at the time for City, you know, was trying to hire me to come over to City. They recognized that they had an underperforming energy franchise at the time and really wanted to grow it. City should have a great franchise. You know, they're global. They have a big, big balance sheet. And so I thought, look, okay, you know, just an opportunity to keep the team together. And so I told, I told Ray, look, if, if uh, you hire the entire team, then we'll come. He was trying to get me at the time. I said, no, we got to take the entire team. So we took the entire team to City. About 20 folks at the time, uh, probably a few more stragglers over there at the, at the mm-hmm. time. And we built up a team uh, of a lot larger than that while at City. Uh, what do you think peak was? Peak well, size. Uh, at City? Yeah. I think, you know, globally, we probably got to about 150, 160. In Houston, we probably were about 60, 55, yeah. 60, maybe even, maybe even 70 at the peak. Um, it was big because, as you highlighted, this yeah. was the time when share was raging, right? Financial yep. buyers were buying up assets. Everybody was paying a lot of money, so there was a lot of leverage financing going on. There were a lot of IPOs going on at the time, a lot of big, large IPOs. Some, some M&A, uh, a lot of it was you know, picking up big chunks of assets, so that's really when the A&D boom yep. took off. Um, and so you know, we were right in the middle of it. You know, we were a capital provider. We had a strong equity franchise and very strong bankers on the energy side. And, and, and then we ultimately built a very strong technical team that helped on, on you know, the A&D side of the business. So it really was a, a, a very strong franchise, and, and I'm proud of the team that we built and, and the folks that are there today. They've done a really nice job. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I recall, I think my 2013 entry analyst class was 11. Uh, I might be wrong, and someone might get offended, but I think it was it was like 11 or 12. So, yeah, it had to be at yeah. least 60 and we, had, and we had three classes, and we had big corporate Bingo. banks. Yep. So it may have been but more than 70. It was, you know, but yeah, I think so in big, Houston. Yeah, it was, right. a big, it was a big number, and I believe me, everybody was working long. I mean, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the joke on the street is that we were a sweatshop. And, and the problem was, you know, I, the last thing I wanted to do is have a reputation as, as having a sweatshop. We were very, very busy. And so I keep hiring more analysts. And the problem with hiring more analysts, it gives all the senior bankers more leverage to do more. And so right. it was like a snowball effect. The more analysts I hired, the more we did, the bigger the sweatshop became, the more we had to hire. It just wouldn't, wouldn't end. And so, you know, you know, we ultimately put all sorts of limits in there to make sure people weren't getting crushed and, you know, try to get rid of that reputation of being a sweatshop. Yeah. I mean... Look, you know, you've probably uh, gone through the, now, what, 35 years of seeing junior bankers come through. You know, a lot of them have gone on to do a lot of really interesting, successful things, either on the financial services side, the corporate side, you know, aspiring podcast hosts. You know, you, you got a lot. <laughs> yeah, look, I've got, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's great. It's, uh, I've got guys who are running at private equity firms. I've got guys who are CEOs or were CEOs of managing companies, guys who have gone on to be, uh, you know, be work, work on the corporate development side, CFOs of energy companies, and still some, you know, it's kind of really interesting to see a lot of the folks that worked for me one, uh, upon the days running various energy shops or had, mm-hmm. had run at, at other firms. I used, to, I used to really get upset when they left uh, yeah. because, you know, we were a family. We really tried to create a culture of family and, and, you know, everybody enjoying each other. Nobody has sharp elbows. We always have everybody's back. And then they leave. And I finally had to get over that because at the end of the day, Everybody wants to, you know, achieve a higher level. Everybody wants sure. to be run an energy group, right? And so I didn't have that to offer it to everybody. And so, you know, I ended up with folks at Deutsche Bank and Barclays and Raymond, uh, at Raymond James and at, uh, you know, RBC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, it just became kind of like the coaching tree, which was, which was great. I mean, it's kind of, we had, we had yeah. a little reunion recently and, and got a lot of people together. And, and so it was great. And, and by the way, so after all that, you know, I retired, you know, which I think surprised everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know what? What had happened there at the end? I take the last two years had taken on the chemicals, uh, power, and energy transition. I built the energy right. transition inside of City. Had to push them to build it quickly because I felt if we didn't build it quickly, we we're going to fall behind. See, that was twenty twenty ish time yeah. frame. Yeah. Uh, just after that, but yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And um, and so you know it was you know, it was a tough time, right? COVID, uh, but we we saw energy transition coming. In a big way, uh, I thought it was going to be big. Yeah, everybody talks about the thousands of companies that comprise energy transition around the world and the trillions of dollars that were going to be spent. And I saw also uh, what you know over my career what Goldman Sachs and Morgan and Stanley had done in technology, and they got there mm-hmm. quick and they built it up quick and had big groups and they were infiltrating the sector. And if you don't do it, you fall behind. You don't have the track record. You don't have the relationships. You don't have the business. 
And I didn't want that to happen in the city. So we built it globally very quickly. Latin America, Canada, U.S., Middle East, Europe, Asia. And, uh, you know, we've got some resistance from the firm because, you know, we're in the middle of COVID. I understood that. Yep. But I also didn't want to fall behind on my watch on energy transition. If we needed to roll it up because things didn't evolve as quickly as we can, then, then you roll it up and you, and you shrink it some. But let's get out ahead of this uh, because the prize is going to be huge if you get ahead of it. And so right. we did that. Uh, and the other thing that was going on at the same time was city was trying to figure out their own plans for net zero, 2030, yep. 2050. Yep. Right. And the first three sectors that they looked at within the city were power, chemicals and energy. Of course. You yeah. know, so guess what? You know, I had to spend a lot of time with outside auditors, compliance, uh, um, you know, and, and, and industry experts to figure out what was our plan to get to a, a net zero by 2050 and a glide path in 2030 that was going to be used as the prototype for other sectors. So you factor all that in. I, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I got worn down by all of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I understand the need to do it. Uh, I think there's still a lot of people that don't fully understand the energy ecosystem and what it takes yep. to do that. But uh, in any case, we spent a lot of time working on that. And, uh, you know, I went on vacation. My wife uh, took me for my birthday over to Europe uh, for my 60th. And, you know, we were there for a week. And half the time I was there, I was on board calls. Yep. We had already started talking about when we were going to retire and, you know, we started working with our family, you know, state planners and stuff and figuring out how to, you know, move assets into our fan, our kids' accounts and stuff like that. Legally, I might add. Um, and uh, when, when all that happened, uh, you know, I came back and said, look, I'm done. I'm, I'm ready. I'm done. Yep. And I was really done. I was done from banking. I didn't I didn't uh, I, I thought there were other things to do, you know, and but I did, wasn't sure what they were. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to explore them. Unless I got out of banking, because banking, as you know, is a twenty-four-seven job, especially when it's a big global, big franchise, and and many franchises at the time. So you know, I, I got out of it. It was a surprise. I, I got to tell you, one of the toughest days of my life was announcing that I was leaving in, fr in, uh, in front of the whole entire energy team, sure. because many of those folks were there because of me, uh, yep. because of what we had built there as a team, and. They, you know, they just were like in a state of shock. I mean, there were a couple of them that were in tears. I mean, it was like, you know, and, and it was, it was, you know, look, I, I was thinking, hey, this is a great opportunity for others to step up, right? That's what happens in banking, right? You, you right. develop over time, you step up, you're there when uh, an opportunity exists. And it was more a state of really, you know, probably a little bit of shock. They were surprised. They, they, you know, we hadn't been, hadn't been talking about it to the team for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was that everybody came to my office and said, you need your kid and your kid. No, I'm not. And, uh, and, and so we left and, um, you know, then I set out to figure out what I was going to do, which was interesting because, you know, when, you, you, when you've been running as hard as, as you have to run in this banking to get to the levels I was at, you know, it's 24 seven, you got things going on all the time, all around the world. And all of a sudden the music just stops. Right. And I really, you know, I, I told people, I think, I think there's an element of this. There's a, there's a PTSD syndrome that, you know, just because you just go, go, go in your mind. I didn't realize this. I really didn't. And this is the thing. I woke up in the middle of the night a lot of times thinking, you know, what, what am I doing? Where am I supposed to be? Who am I supposed to be calling on right now? You know, what's going on? And, you know, you just say, you know, you don't want to read the, you know, the paper the next day for fear of a deal getting announced and you were involved in it. And then I right. have to remind myself, wait, I'm not, I'm not doing this You're anymore. not in the game I, anymore. Yeah, I don't yeah. have those pressures anymore. Yeah. And, you know, my, my wife used to tell me all the time, look, you know, I used to say, I'm not stressed. And she goes, you're always stressed. I said, I'm not, you know, and, and you realize the reason you don't feel stressed is because the, the stress levels don't go up and down, up and down. They're constant. Right. So you don't yeah. feel like you're stressed, right? And, and if, you, if there was volatility in that level of stress, you'd feel like when, when you were highly stressed and when you weren't stressed, it was always stressed. And uh, so, you, Canley, it was probably a good time to have taken off then in hindsight. Yeah. And I needed to let some of that settle and get behind me. And I played a lot of golf. I, it was great. And, you know, I, I met, you know, it was interesting. I wanted to do nothing for three months. And, mm -hmm. But everybody was coming to me with ideas. Everybody, oh, sure. everybody yeah. thought they had an idea. Hey, be an advisory director here. Come do this with me. Do this. At the end of the day, so I was meeting with lots of people, even though I said I wasn't going to do anything for at least three months. So I was occupied all day long. And um, ultimately, there was nothing really that smacked me in the face and said, this is it. I mean, I looked at, I looked at opportunities in sports. I looked at opportunities in, in the corporate world. I looked at private equity, venture capital. I looked at a lot of different things, but 
given where I am in my career, and the, the, you know, it really had to be something special. There was nothing. I, I really thought, was hopeful that there might be something in the sports world. And I'm a, mm -hmm. a huge, a huge uh, sports aficionado, big time basketball fan. And I thought there'd just be something in you know front office someplace, do something like that. And look, I can understand. You know, I'm a 60 year old guy who's never done it. You got to come in. What are you going to do? You know. So, um, so anyway, it was great. And you know, I had a lot of banks over the course of the last 18 months come to me and say, you know, you're not done. Come, come, come work here. Here's a role. Some of it was full time running things. Some of it was being an advisory director or just come in and help develop our group. I really didn't want to do it. I really tried to resist for a long time. Uh, it was interesting because I went out um, a year ago. I was going out to a, a venture capital fund annual meeting I got invited out to, mm -hmm. and it was out in Los Angeles. And so when I was in Los Angeles, I, I just picked up the phone and I called Ken, Ken, Ken Molas, who I had known, obviously, for a long, long time. Yeah, obviously, yeah. The one thing I didn't say earlier is when I came to City, the other th place I was contemplating going was to Molas and Company before it went public. Got it. Got it. He was, he'd given me a phenomenal offer at the time to come open up the Houston office and run the energy franchise. And look, even back in hindsight, I probably made a wrong financial decision because they had it gone there. And yeah, yeah. What happened to the stock and what the intended. Big chunk of a, of a public investment bank now. Yeah. He's right. got a phenomenal job. He's got a $4 yeah. billion dollar investment bank. He right. started from scratch. So kudos to the team there. And, uh, but look, uh, you know, I went to the uh, city, built a great franchise there with the help of all my teammates. And I, I don't ever want to put it on me because, you know, at the end of the day, I'm all about the team. And, you know, it was a lot of people that it took, you know, a lot of sweat and equity and a lot of hard work to get to where that franchise got to. But, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, I was out in L.A. And so I picked up the phone and called Kenny and I went to his house and we were just talking about, you know, estate planning and a lot of things about the kids and grandkids mm -hmm. and and uh, and I left, and I went to the annual meeting. I came back, and, and about a month later, I got a call from Jeff Rach, who's one of the co-founders and president of Mollison Company. And he said, "Steve, I heard you went to go see Kenny." And I told Kenny that nobody comes to see you if they're not looking for a job. So I just wanted to <laughs> see if Ken misread this because he said, "No, you were not looking for a job. You were done," or whether you're really looking for a job. And I said, "No, I was not looking for a job. I was just coming by to see Ken." Somebody who I had revered and, and worked for uh, for a long time and had done a great thing. And he looks, I got to be honest with you, Ken is one of the absolute greatest investment bankers there is out there. I can tell you all kinds of stories about some of the stuff he did to help us achieve transactions and a lot of stuff he's done. When you look at his advising Aramco on their IPO, and when you look at the fact that they've done 15 deals with Adnoc over the last year, I mean, mm -hmm. they, they have the strong, it was that written in the Wall Street Journal just a couple of weeks they ago. They crushed it in the Middle East. The yeah. strength of the Middle East. I mean, who would have thought this, guy, you know, this guy from L.A. who starts an investment bank is going to dominate Middle East uh, energy investment banking, but they have. And uh, anyway, I said no, but he said, look, if you, ever, if you ever want to come back to banking, you've always got a job with me. And, you know, that, that was great. And in the meantime, some big banks had called, some other boutiques had called, and I said, no, no, no. I did say, tell Ken, though, look, if you're going to build out your bank, here's a few people that you should look at. And, mm -hmm. you know, one, one was uh, a guy from our uh, energy transition team at City who was looking to go to another firm. He'd been talking to a bunch of other banks. And I said, I told them, don't go until you talk to Ken Wallace. It's a great platform. You need to at least go explore that. Long story short, he ends up going there. And then Ken calls me up and he was talking about upstream bankers. And I said, look, you, you got a one of the best teams on Wall Street. Technically, uh, guys, every client loves these guys. You need to go talk to them. And, uh, you know, they, they, they you know, weren't completely satisfied with what they were doing where they were. And he, he met with them and he hired them. And, uh, you know, those two bankers, uh, are, you know, Alex Burphy and Mohamed Lagari, and it was announced when I got announced a couple of days ago that they're starting on Monday. But, you know, they, you know, Mola's put back the entire franchise, a lot of the pieces, uh, folks I'd worked with. And so they all started calling me and said, hey, we, we, need, a, we need a fearless leader. And um, so, they, you know, Ken talked to me and, and you know, I said, look, uh, 18 months on the golf course has been great. I, I really did enjoy it, but I can't do that for the next 25 years. I mean, sure. let's face it. When you've been a banker for 34 years, you've got a certain DNA, you've got a certain competitiveness. You're watching the, trans you know, the transaction after transaction in the sector go by you. I said, look, and by the way, I got a lot of clients. That I, was, I was really surprised. A lot of clients called and said, look, we've got a lot of good people in the sector, a lot of people that can, you know, run uh, NAV models and do this. But we don't have a lot of people that have the level of experience you've got, the number of transactions you've worked on, the amount of boardroom experience you have to, you know, you, 
we can't we need you back. We want you back. Yep. And I, 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 look, I, I was very humbled. I, it was a huge compliments. But I said, that's great. But these guys are all very good. You're getting lots of deals done without me. You don't need me. And uh, But when all this kind of came together, I said, you know what? And it took a long time. You know, there's some other firms with one of my former bosses from City, who is now president at Lazard. And, and uh, look, he, he, you know, he was, you know, he and I are very close. And, you know, that they made that an opportunity. And I just said, look, I love the folks uh, that I worked with on his UBS at the senior levels who are now the senior management executive team over at at Molisa. They got a lot of my team members. It's just, it's just kind of a, another piece of the puzzle. So it all kind of came together. The long winded answer, but it all kind of came together. Well, you were kind of, you know, you're in the sports analogy here is your free agent. And uh, you're a free agent who decided you wanted to come back. And so, you know, every team's going to have a pitch. And uh, this pitch was the best because you wanted to get that team back together. You know, Raj, you know me. Uh, and you're absolutely right. And you know the guys that I have on the team now. They, they're Not only are they great bankers, they're great people. They have yeah. a great sense of their client service, their hustle, they want to win, and they're just good people to be around. And, you know, one of the things I've done throughout my entire career is really put good people, people who check their egos at the door, people who are all about team first, not I first. And, uh, you know, I think that's the goal here. And, I, you know, I'd be remiss to say that, you know, David Cunningham, who runs the Houston office of Bulls, he was a key part of this, too. He welcomed me in day one when we started talking. He said, absolutely, watch it. This would be great. Uh, David's done a great job, you know, getting that office to where it is today. And, you know, they've got 55 bankers in that office. You know, it's, wow. it's a big office. And so, we, you know, we just added another 10. <laughs> well, Mo told me you guys are, I think, moving offices. So I'm excited to go check out the new new digs, well, whatever. We've, got, uh, whatever we've got no choice because we're busting at the scene. So <laughs> it's going to take a little while. We've got to find the office. We've got to have to build it out. But you're absolutely right. We've got, we've got to find an office in downtown Houston. This is well, probably every real estate uh, agent's going to call me now. For, you know, after, after that's gonna... right. Now, good thing is it, it does feel like you got your pick of the litter right now in, in downtown Houston. So I think I think you got, you know. There's a lot of space available. Be. Let's talk 18 months of retirement. During that 18 months, obviously, you joined a handful of boards. You saw uh, a bunch of different things. Nothing caught your eye from a full-time perspective. Uh, what was the most fun sort of either personal thing or professional thing that happened during that 18-month period? Gosh, you know, I mean, was, you know, professionally, I was able to go on some boards, and I'm and working on some things now I can't talk about, but they're fun. They're with folks. Almost all of them were with folks that I had known well before. A couple of them were with some uh, companies that I was working with while I was at City. Um, mm -hmm. So all of that was all of that was fun and fine, and, and there's some ongoing things. Um, but look, I think at the end of the day, you know, you know, when you when you're taking 18 months off, it's uh, it's being able to spend time with your family. Uh, we did win the member member golf tournament down here in uh, in in my uh, vacation home uh, in Los Cabos with a, with actually a former CFO of Cameron Industries. Tom Hicks, who, and so we, we won that. That was a lot of fun because I never won any golf tournament. But, you know, <laughs> my golf game had gotten better. Uh, you know, you take 18 months and you play a lot of golf, it gets better. So that was that was a lot of fun. But I tell you, just being able to spend time, more time with friends, not having to be, interestingly, not having to be on the phone nonstop. All the time, at yeah. Text all the time, you know, and, and actually being present um, was, you know, it was, it was great. We had a great time. I had, I had a grandchild during that period. Oh, awesome. Uh, so my, uh, yeah, so it was great. Well, so what's changed? Obviously, that 18-month period, I mean, probably record M&A during that time. I'm sure you made a lot of intros in the background that, you know, you could have been fully on the deal on if, if you had been in your, your prior. Well, some, some of the deals, a number of the deals that uh, that happened at City over the last year was stuff that we initiated before we left, right? Yeah. And, and, and that was great. I mean, they had a great team. They were able to ultimately get it over the goal line. It's great. One thing to get hired is nothing to get it over the goal line. Sure. So they're taking no credit away from any of those. They did all the all the folks over at City over the last 18 months did a great job in being a number of very large transactions. There were mm -hmm. a, a number of them. So kudos to all of them. Um, but look, I, I still think there's 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 two things going on, right? You've got the traditional oil and gas companies. Right. And we've seen a lot of consolidation thus far, particularly at the large cap size. There's still more to go, right? There's, yeah. There has to be more. And there has to be more because, candidly, at the end of the day, the S&P you know, index is about 3.5% now oil and gas, right? Yeah. So if you're not big, you know, I remember early days of my career, you, you know, you used, you used to go from $1 billion, you got to be $2 billion, you got to be $5 yeah. billion, you know, went to 10 If you're not $20 billion today, it's going to be a struggle to get the attention of investors. You yep. don't have, you know, to be weighted in energy, you don't have to hold a whole lot. 
and a no, lot of energy no. investors have folded their tents and gone home. I think it's a mistake, by the way, because if you look at the cash flow yields coming out of oil and gas companies today, and you Impressive. look at yep. what they're doing, these are great returns. I mean, if you don't if you don't have a good weighting uh, in oil and gas, you know you're going to be you're losing uh, relative to peers that do. So, I think I think the tide will turn at some point, just not yet, because I don't think you can not be invested in these companies that have great growth, great cash yields, and, and distributing their cash. And but what you got to do now is the small guys have to be bigger. I mean, one of the things is interest rates rose. The cost of capital between the bigger investment grade companies and the non investment grade companies was as wide as it's ever yep. been, right? Yep. And if you're going to generate excess returns for your shareholders, you know, it's a whole lot better to have a low cost of capital than a higher cost of capital, right? Just, right. you know, finance 101. And, um, and so those companies needed to find a way to get to investment grade. And the fastest way to get there is obviously through mergers. If you're sub 20 today, you know, you need to find a way to get to 20. Now, it doesn't mean you can't make money, you know, two, three, four, five billion. I mean, you, you don't have, you know, you can still grow and, and, and generate great returns. But ultimately, to get public attention, you needed to be bigger. The other, the other factor, by the way, is there's a number of the banks that are getting out of the energy business, right? Yeah. I mean, and so getting access to capital is becoming harder. And, right. you know, when you start talking about net zero, these banks having to get to net zero, guess what? That means, you know, you're going to have to make decisions on how much you lend and where. And so these are all factors playing into it that's driving this ultimately, and I think we'll continue to see it. Um, I do think that through these mergers, when you look at the you know the big mergers, the the uh, Chevron has the if, if that group goes through, and I think it will, the uh, the Exxon Pioneers and the uh, Conoco's. I mean, I'm sorry, the Oxy and, and Crown Quest and Diamondback and Endeavors. There are going to be assets in that portfolio that sit at the far right side of the return spectrum, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, are not generating the kind of returns that the top 75%, those things ought to be sold out, sold off, and companies, you know, that can, can attack those and generate better returns with those should should, should go after those. Um, but we are running out of tier one inventory. Returns are harder to get to, right? So again, size and, and lowering your cost of capital and generating efficiencies through operations, which you accomplish through scale. It's how you have to generate the returns. So I do think you'll see a lot more there. We haven't seen the midstream really consolidate yet. We've seen a couple of yep. transactions happen, but there's still, you know, when you when your ultimate uh, customer um, is is, cons cons is consolidating, you ultimately you don't need as many as much infrastructure. And by the way, the infrastructure we're going to have to build out ultimately when we have a an administration that allows us to do so is going to be costly. The cost of yep. maintaining this, is, you know, it's now. 20 years old, 30 years old, cost of maintenance, the cost of making sure we don't have have emission uh, uh, leaks, um, et cetera. The, that cost is going up. And so, yep. again, same thing like the upstream business, being able to generate a lower cost of capital um, through being an investment grade, strong investment grade company is, is going to be critical. So I think we'll see more consolidation in the upstream. And then at the end of the day, those companies servicing those companies, both the upstream and midstream, yep. have to consolidate. they got to be bigger. There's fewer of those to service. You got to be bigger, and so we'll see that. You know, I mean, we, we the biggest guys. There's really not a lot of consolidation that can happen. They're already big everywhere. They, you know, yeah. they've got market share issues that, that, in that they're too big. But there's a lot of companies that are you know sub two billion that are going to have to find their way to consolidate, or they're not going to get any attention by the public market. They trade at very low valuations. Yeah, I mean, we we've seen this wave right uh, on the upstream side, which is all the big PE that in 2020 was a big concern, like. How are funds going to generate? Well, they punched out in the last 18 months, and it's been a phenomenal return. And the guys that still haven't punched out, they will, and they'll do quite well. Um, and then you're seeing all the public market consolidation. Feels like that wave, to your point, will continue. Midstream will probably follow suit thereafter. Right. And then the second order effect, it sounds like, from your perspective, is some of the non-core assets will get shed off. And the question then becomes, who's going to buy that? You know, are, are the funds going to be able to raise enough institutional capital to go chase down those opportunities, or is that going to go to a different class? Of I, I think it's two, two groups of, I think, two groups of investors. Number one is there are still a few funds out there who have been highly successful. You know, the Quantums and the NCAPs and the Pearls and the Cornelians and the Riverbends, et cetera, very successful, generated great returns, and they're able to continue to uh, raise capital, maybe not at the levels that they once could, but they're still able to raise capital to reinvest in those things. But you also have those companies that are on the fringe that are really trying to make it, 
that need to add assets into their mix so that they, they can scale up themselves. They're big enough to get attention from somebody else. Exactly. And so you know, I think those are two, the two buyer universes ultimately. There are some family offices, Canada, that are starting to kind of come together and look at some of this because the returns, like I said earlier, are fantastic. And, right. you know, you're investing in things uh, or you got extra liquidity in, in, in your hands. You know, these oil and gas assets are, are absolutely fantastic. In, in my short career in oil and gas, I'm not sure there's been a better time from an asymmetric upside perspective of upstream oil and gas assets, right? Um, you know, you can acquire assets today, you know, outside of, let's say, core Permian drilling inventory for PDP, PV, 15 or so, let's say more or less. Uh, at today's interest rate environment, you'll be able to put some leverage on it, let's say nothing too nuts. But there's almost no way you're not going to get your money back, you know, and uh, you, you have a levered upside to the future. And, and to your point, we're sort of out of the tier one drilling inventory. It's kind of gone. And this is a depleting resource. So on a long enough time horizon, the resource is going to have some more additional value. And so it's kind of crazy that uh, this is not compelling enough for a lot of people to invest. You know, I 100% I agree with everything you just said, right? I mean, absolutely. And, you know, as you drill uh, inventory that costs more, your oil costs, and you're not going to drill. Look, look what's going on in the gas markets right now, right? Because right? gas prices are falling. They're laying down rigs, right? That will happen in oil if, you, if, if the cost of extraction is so much that you can't make a return. And so what does that mean? Oh, well, you know, you're going to reduce your demand, your supply, and your prices are going to rise. Well, when they rise, you're going to go back and generate good returns in those areas. So just being able to hold those assets in, in cyclical times, I think OPEC has done a really nice job in kind of making sure that they maintain strength. You know, they, they seem to want to see at least an $80 oil price. That's plenty of money. It works for everybody. Yeah, yeah. It works make for a lot everybody. of money. I mean, look, I, I commiserate to a certain extent with a lot of these executives. I met with a lot of these executives. I think completely disappeared over my 18 months. And they're saying, <laughs> they say, Steve, you know, it, it's really hard because I can generate at these kind of oil prices, you know, 70 to 130% rates of returns. And yet I'm paying down debt. I'm paying right. down, you know, I'm paying down six, seven, eight percent debt. That just makes no sense. And, you know, the market's trying to keep them very disciplined. You know, we've seen those periods where everybody starts drilling and they, you know, and all of a sudden supply, supply picks up and oil prices fall. And this has been a, a great market. Everybody's re re remained disciplined. The public markets have forced that on folks. If you start to talk about raising your capital budgets too much, you know, people exit and, and you get punished. Yeah. Right? It's very so, clear what's happening, right? You know, for a long time, it was just grow at all costs, you know, which is good. Uh, look, if you're in the service part of the business, uh, that's good for everybody, right? Like we just saw U.S. shale go up into the right. That creates, you know, a big stimulus for the U.S. economy. Let's be clear. However, you know, that sort of rolled over at one point and the investor said, we don't like this anymore, you know, and a lot of capital did get torched. Yeah, you know, and they're, they're not Look, wrong. I think OPEC played a role in that too, right? Yep. OPEC was saying, wait, guys, U.S. has taken away a lot of this market share. Sure. Yep. We need to, you know, so they kept pumping. They were driving prices down to try to drive a lot of this uh, nonsense, you know, that they believed was yep. happening uh, out. And over time, they were successful, right? Yep. Uh, and, you know, investors walked away and said, guys, you know, you, you don't want to be left holding a bag. And, and this turns right. too quick. And people have a hard time getting out of that, a lot of these stocks. And, and they lost a bunch of money. And so and then, OPEC, you know, look, OPEC, they're, they're smart folks. They, they, they you know, power they, power. they did what they needed to took, Probably took longer than they thought they, they would. Yeah. I think the break-evens, you know, as, as these quote-unquote science projects early days became, you know, they really well, understood. Yeah. They became, you know, everybody could... could uh, develop and, and produce it, the oil and gas at a much lower cost. And I think that surprised uh, the Middle East to how, sure. how cheap that was. And so they, kept, they had to keep it, they had to keep the, uh, their foot on the pedal for longer, keep driving those prices down. But today we've got, you know, I would argue that one of the best energy environments we've ever seen. OPEC seems to be very disciplined. We've got good demand. We've got good growth uh, in, in demand. We've got uh, the U.S. markets being very disciplined. So it's a very functional market. The gas market's still a little crazy. Uh, who would have at thought? At least for the near know, term, it looks pretty months late, yeah. ago, you know, we're looking at five dollar for MCF, and now we're sitting at you know dollar sixty sixty five. So it's it's crazy, you know. But you know, like uh, the, the one silver lining of all of this is you do see a quick reaction now.
in terms of recounts, in terms of building duck inventory. I mean, it is the one beauty of shale, I think, versus anything long-term horizon is it is short cycle. You, you know, you can make those sort of changes. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's what we saw, right? When it was $5, guess what? Bingo. Everybody was putting out rigs. And, and guess what? Supply goes way up. Prices come down. That's what we saw in the oil markets for so long. That's right. We got to we got to get to a, a disciplined market. But look, we have a lot of LNG coming online over the next eighteen months, twenty four months. That'll soak up a lot of a lot of demand. We got to get that built. Uh, I do think that the U.S. is in a great position to help supply a lot of uh, energy to our allies. We got to get a, an administration that you know understands that. And look, we all understand what's going on. You know, they delayed permits not to study the impact, but to get votes and. And, you know, and, and look, that's, you know, we see this political stuff go on a lot, but it's impact. It's going to impact jobs. It's going to impact our, our allies. You know, our, our allies aren't going to sit there and be energy short. They're going to get it from other places. No. Get and, places and, uh, other guys are taking advantage, right? Uh, like you, you saw a big uh, cutter announcement. Uh, they're going to expand. That's, you know, uh, as of last year, I think the U.S. and cutter are effectively tied. Right. And uh, their plan is to go to 85 percent increase by the end of the decade. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, probably should catch up with that. But things are taking longer. You know, the, the permit timeline doesn't help. Uh, but the Gulf Coast is arguably the best place in the world to be uh, exporting LNG out. Right. Yeah, like, absolutely. absolutely. It and, and, and it will continue and jobs yeah. will be continue. And it's just, you know, we got to get through this election cycle, which is crazy into its own right. But um, so look, that's you know that's fundamentally the oil and gas business. The other side of what I'm doing is energy transition, which is a whole different world, right? I mean, yep. uh, it sounds like this is just an unbelievably great market. Thousands of companies being created, you know, trillions of dollars being spent. Mm -hmm. When you look at the companies that are public, or you look at the ones that have been funded, you know, there's a lot of heartache out there. I mean, there's oh, a yeah. lot of companies who are down 60, 80 percent. Um, you know, well, or, it shouldn't have been public companies, right? We had a zero interest rate environment. Uh, you know, obviously, you, you had seen the number of SPACs that were involved. Uh, you know, everyone had an energy transition SPAC. And the reality is when things are at zero interest rate and investors are, are comfortable with zero revenue, uh, that, you know, that works. But in a world where we need those revenue and, and we need those projections to work out, you have inflationary costs. You don't hit those numbers. Well, every, everybody got you for it, right? All the big investors are talking about ESG, ESG. Um, you know, we got to put all this money into it, pouring money into it, raising money for these funds. You know, you look at, you know, TPG rise, raising seven and a half billion, and it's a race that how big can your funds be? And capital is pouring in. You know, yes, SPACs for sure. But there was coming in from, you know, venture capital. It was coming in from private equity. It was coming in from lots of places. And, uh, you know, you just got, you know, like anything, when this pendulum swings too far, it's exactly. going to be, it, be an effect. And now we're paying the price for an effect. That's right. Do, uh, you know, look, there, there are going to be great companies created because of this. Uh, yep. The IRA, not, you know, I, I think the RA is actually probably a good thing, not, notwithstanding probably is, is, you know, you throw that kind of money at things, you're going to have inflation. And, uh, but, you know, well, you know, we ultimately are where we are today in wind and solar renewable because – of the incentives that were provided back 10, 15 years ago, right? You got to right. work down the cost curve. You got to be able to scale up. There's going to, you know, and, 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 and that was in really two business lines, I'd argue. Today, we've got business lines across lots of things, whether it be biofuels and, and, uh, and um, uh, what was I thinking? Um, we got, you know, we got, bio, you got CCS, US, we got biofuels, we've got hydrogen. Hydrogen was, I was trying to, yep. another form of fuels, right? And everything hydrogen. I still haven't get my head around yet what can make money and what can't and you know but but look we were there with wind and solar it never right. made money before without the incentives and the incentives are there right now we'll see what happens if we have an administration change or not whether they stay in there i, can't, I guess you really need a congress change not not just an administration change but um look i, I do think you know I, I i like to think i coined this phrase energy addition a lot of people have said all of the above whatever it yeah. is but we do need in this world more energy so it can be affordable that's distributable around the world where people need energy where you have you know uh developing nations that want to grow their standards of living you know we're, we're blessed in america to have the kind of standards absolutely that we yeah have, but there's not even the world that doesn't have that and if they're going to achieve any kind of increased standard of living it's going to require a lot more energy and so we need it and you called it yeah so this was a, let's call it about two years ago i think you had a viral post on linkedin which was effectively like you know 
more or less like, wake up, guys. Uh, you know, we're going to need oil and gas and we're going to need. Like, it's, it's, it's not either, it's and, uh, which was like, I thought, very well written at the time. It, it may be obvious today uh, that we've sort of come to that conclusion, but at that time, the assumption was, uh, you know, it's sort of either. Um, and I thought it was, it was well put. Um, when you think about that now, sort of fast forwarding, how do you think about a traditional energy company participating in transition or let's call it non oil and gas today, right? So we have a fairly healthy energy economy in the U S so you, you're seeing the consolidation. How do you think companies ought to play that? Uh, Look, I think first and foremost, every energy company should be looking at their own existing operations and trying to do what they can to lower emissions. Uh, you know, methane detection, uh, et cetera, flaring, all these things yep. should, should be able to go. We have the technology to eliminate that, to prevent a lot of that. That should be standard. That should be, you know, base level. Right. Um, as it pertains to other forms, uh, whether it be, you know, things like CCUS, whether it be hydrogen, whether it be other forms of energy, biofuels, you know, look, I think that needs to be played at the companies that are large, that have cost of capital advantages, that mm -hmm. have plenty of access to capital, that are global in nature, yep. that you know have a lot of the what I'd say the engineering, material sciences capabilities internally, R and D capabilities, and I, so I think that's where it should be. It should be at the Exxon, Shells, BPs, you know, Chevrons, Totals, Statoils, Oxys, and Conocos of the world. Right? Those are the companies that should start that. And what I like about what's going on in upside up, uh, upstream consolidation now is these companies are getting bigger. These, right. the, the ones below those, right? And so these companies can can become one of those companies that can also take that on and can spend money and be, because I do think those are the companies that ought to have extended. They, they are energy companies. They don't call themselves right. anymore oil and gas companies. It is across the board. It is their job, you know, uh, constituted by shareholders who invest in them to provide energy to the world, all of these companies. And it's not just oil and gas. You know, how do we get energy to all parts of the world, like I said earlier, to raise your standard of living? So I think it's where it needs to be for the time being. Doesn't mean are we spending enough in those companies? Probably not. These guys are making record profits. Could you spend a little bit more? Could you be, you know, but they're, they're, look, I would also say as much as we all know and we live in the energy ecosystem, they're doing a lot more than we know. They've got all kinds right. of projects going on that we don't even hear about. So, you know, we, we, we know the larger ones. They talk about the larger ones, you know, what Exxon's doing in CCUS and what Oxy's doing. And, you know, look, they're doing a lot and they're doing more than we even know. So I think it's where it needs to be. Um, and, you know, I think they plan to be able to provide all sources of energy. They, you know, they, I don't think they're just trying to keep it to oil and gas and, you know, making sure none of the stuff. They can produce hydrogen cost effectively, and all of a sudden we can start using fuel cells and other things in transportation, and we can produce enough SAF. We can do biofuels. That's where it needs to be with the refiners. And, by the way, mm -hmm. large refiners too, Marathon and Valero, they play a big part of this as well on, on the biofuel side. So I do think it's where it needs to be. Everybody needs to take care of their operations first and foremost, and then they need to think about how do I provide other sources, how do I grow other sources of energy besides just oil and gas. Right. I think, you know, last few years, certainly the methane abatement, uh, you know, and sort of decarbonizing the operations has become f far more cost effective. And the knowledge sharing around the upstream universe became quite obvious, right? Like the sheer amount of responsibly sourced gas and things like that, like massive massive emissions reduction compared to any of these sort of uh, carbon removal type schemes, in my opinion. Um, and now you have this interesting world where the bigger you are, the more you can take a sliver of your capex and effectively invest it elsewhere. And the downside is quite limited. And the upside could be, you know, asymmetrically up, right? Like yep. you get on the right bet, it could be a new business division for you. Look, I'll give you a great example. Look what Chesapeake is doing. Right, Chesapeake came out, and you talked about resource, responsibly uh, sourced gas. They started that early. They've gotten big, right? They made a lot of acquisitions. The most recent one announced, obviously, Southwestern. Now they're talking about how we take that gas, how we provide LNG. LNG is transition fuel. It is the transition to what we need in society. We need to get rid of coal, first and foremost. Canada, I'd like to see us get rid of dung and wood and all that yep. stuff, too. But we need to get rid of coal. It's much bigger. And Toby Rice has been absolutely on the pulpit about this, and he needs to be. We need to have more people speaking about this because that's what we need. And, um, and what Chesapeake is doing is, is, is out there as well. And, they, you, know, they're, they're, you know, they and EQT are right at the top of the, of the heap in terms of natural gas 
uh, companies in, in, in North America, and I think they ultimately will be global natural gas companies. And, you know, they're all talking about the LNG and playing roles overseas. And why are they? Because guess what, Toby? Yep. Toby took control of EQT and drove the size of that company, drove the cost of capital down, gave them the resources to be able to go do that. Same thing with Chesapeake. You know, to Nick DeLasso and, and, and Mike Wistrich, you know, they've done a phenomenal job. And so we we, we got to be proud of America. You know, capitalism does work, right? I mean, yeah. it, it really, it really I think does. That's right. We've gotten really good at extracting natural gas uh, the cheapest possible way, the most sustainable possible way. And I think that's right. I was actually telling someone the other day, because, look, we're, we're spoiled. Like, the United States is very easy for us to think about, like, okay, look, here's what the world ought to look like. Here's what we want. Here's what we don't. The U.S. is about 300-odd uh, million people. I won, in my opinion, the genetic lottery being born uh, in the United States. You know, my parents are both immigrants. Uh, you know, in, in every other s- uh, simulation of my life, I'd be born on the other side of the world. I'd be born in India, where we now have the largest population in one country. It's, it's outbeat China. About 1.4 billion people. And I think what's not really talked about is... One billion of those 1.4 are 35 and under. So that's, you know, about 3x the size of the United States yep. is 35 and under on the complete other side of the globe. And they're all English speaking and they want the United States lifestyle. And for that, they're going to have an incredible amount of consumption. And in order for that economy to be powered, period, forget about decarbonized, powered, they're going to need natural gas. And the beautiful part of that is they're going to decarbonize by consuming that natural gas because right now it's it's coal and it's not the most efficient operation. Oh, look, you know, you only need to go visit. I know you've been there. I've been there and drive around in the smog. And, you know, it's from, you know, coal. Right. And, uh, and, and, and you need to do that. You need to go. We can't. It's not going to do the world any good if we decarbonize in the U.S. and some, you know, Europe and Germany. That's right. You've got China and, and India and other places, you know, to continue with the coal, coal plants and, and not – you know, n- not transition that. So, you know, you're 100 percent right. But we've got to have enough natural gas. There is enough natural gas in the world to be able to do this. There's a lot of places you can extract natural gas. Right. If, if oils, I mean, I'm sorry, if gas is more than a dollar fifty. Now in Europe, right. it really it, it is <laughs> right. And and but we 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 you know we we need natural gas to be at a reasonable value uh, to drive standards of living and and continue to extract it around the world. Right. There's lots of places you can extract it. I mean. There's, there's trillions of cubic feet, you know, off Turkey, off Israel, just sit, sitting right there, you know, to be extracted. And we, we got, we need to do that. We need to teach. We need to be, we can, we need to take our biggest and best energy companies and, and do that. I think that's right. I, I think it is the last decade of figuring out how to extract natural gas at scale out of shale reservoir. Obviously, you know, start, started really with Aubrey, I think, uh, as, as sort of the patron saint of this. Um, and now it's yeah, sort we can, of we can, we can go into all kinds of great stories. Yeah, about right. Aubrey. We, we both had a lot of interactions with Aubrey, and he's one of the, one of the great stalwarts of, of this industry. We, we miss him right. a lot. Yeah. And, and that's paid an incredible subsidy over the last decade to the United States in the form of growth. It's effectively free energy uh, for the U.S. Uh, citizenry as well as every large corporation, which – Every big company today, look at the top S&P 500s, all big tech companies, all of which consume an incredible amount of power. And that's good for all of us, right? Like, we, we don't even think uh, twice. But our lives have been made better because of those big tech companies. But if you look at that's it, right. look at look at Amazon, right? Yeah. You know, big, big computer centers, planes, right. trucks, you know, they, they consume more energy than virtually any company. But Amazon is coming to every one of our houses every day. You That's know, right. So, you know, and and it's not going to stop. Me. I want the no. package in four hours. <laughs> I want it in four hours. You know, I don't really want you to put three different orders into one box because my wife wants it tomorrow. And so, yeah, that way, that's one of the great things changed. about having been on vacation for 18 months. I now get to see how much stuff is coming to my house every day. <laughs> I, mean, I tell my wife, I got a knock on the door one time. And it was the, eight, uh, it was the uh, Amazon guy. And he was just checking on my wife to see if she was okay because it was two days in a row. She went without a package. You was, yeah. didn't, you know, you were not retired. You you took a new job, which was a professional <laughs> Amazon box collector and crusher. And you got you got to crush all these boxes and you know put them all uh, on the well, side. You know, you know when the money stops coming in because you're not working anymore, and you see all the packages still coming in, and it means the money's going out. Like, hold it, hold it. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, you're, you're running too many rigs. Is, uh, <laughs> <it's a problem. laughs> exactly. 
It's uh, yeah, 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 outspending cash flows like the the Floyd Wilson quote. Whenever uh, whenever everyone started talking about getting into cash flow, Floyd Floyd came on. He had some hard energy interview. I forget the, the quote was great. It was something like, "I've never operated an oil and gas business within cash flow. I sell it, and then all the cash flow comes in. It comes in at the end. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's, it's like it's like a baseball or basketball team. You don't ever operate those teams within cash flow. You get it. You you make it when you sell it. That's right. Okay, well, a couple more here. Um, if you if you were sort of if thinking through, you know, energy addition, I think we kind of know what's happening on the upstream oil and gas side, and midstream side. You're spending a lot of time on boards, some with early stage businesses, a lot of them you sort of in the clean tech area. If you were 25 again, and you were looking to be on the founder side versus, let's say, on the on the banking side, what are the sort of businesses that get you really excited that you're like man i think there's an opportunity here okay you know i you have to you have to first and foremost look at the the entire energy transition worldwide because there's so much going on in so many different technologies right so people are exploring that and there has been you know thus far ample amount of capital now there Mm -hmm. are big gaps in that right i mean there's a lot of venture capital out there there's a lot of growth equity out there, but there are those gaps. You know, when, you know, trying to get to FID on some of these big projects is not hard. It's, it's not easy. Tough. It's trying to raise that big chunk of capital, fifty to hundred million dollars, uh, that gets you there. That gets you, you know, the feed studies, that gets you everything up. Uh, a couple of my companies I'm on the board of, that's what they're going through right now. And then there's a it's missing tough. part in that area right there of folks that you know can step up. And where where it's been filled most recently, it's really been strategics. So right. if you're if you're going to build a big SAF. SAF facility, you need to think about who, who are they going to be the suppliers of the raw materials, who's actually going to build your facility, and who's going to be the off-takers. That's where you got to go seek your capital to kind of get there. Because once and the you off-taker got- will say it will come in and invest because they're not going to get it if they don't invest, right? Exactly. Uh, right? And so you, you need that capital there. And then, and then once you get to FID and you know, the project's real and you got it, you, know, you can go raise the project financing. The equity holders come in. They can look at the returns and and in, in that, that part of the capital structure, that part of the phase, phase of raising capital is, is, is pretty secure uh, if you have a good returning project. Um, but it's that piece in the middle that's been very challenging. So going back to your original question, you know, what would you do? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd be looking at energy transition opportunities. Where can I get in? What kinds of technologies? Now, you know, the hard part is there's going to be a lot of money lost, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there has been a lot of money lost. There's been a lot of technologies that have not worked to date. Uh, people are still trying to find, you know, work up the technology curve and down the cost curve and trying to figure out how to make some of these things work. Hydrogen is a big, big part of that. You know, people talking green, blue, gold, pink hydrogens. You know, at the end of the day, let's just get the hydrogen out there let's, and, and let's make it economic. And then let's figure out how to go from economic hydrogen to green hydrogen if you can because green right. hydrogen is very difficult. Um, and there will be certain places and certain people that can do it. They're strategically located in various places that have easier access to to wind and solar and things like that. But um, but that's where I'd be focused. There's just so much opportunity, so much capital. It's exciting. You know, you go into these companies and they have great, exciting, they're entrepreneurs. You go into any of these companies, by the way, most of them are, you're right, they're 25 to 35. It's like the tech world. It is the tech world, right? Yep. And these guys have a dream and they're living out their dream and they want to go, you know, build a company that's going to be a multi-billion dollar unicorn, right? So um, that's exciting. And, you know, and Kelly, we, we need this in, in society. Um, yeah, no and I'm glad it's happening here, right? Like the, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, to date, I still don't think there's another country in the world where you can come up with a business plan and a slide deck and say, hey, I want to go disrupt XYZ industry. And yeah, the investors going to laugh after the meeting's over. They say, hey, uh, you know, let's toss a couple million bucks their way and make a couple calls and see where this goes. It's exactly yeah. right. And no better place in the U.S. You're 100 percent correct. And, you know, you got a lot of entrepreneurial uh, folks, a lot of schools teaching entrepreneurialism in the schools. And, you know, whether it be for tech or whether it be for clean tech or whatever. And, you know, I, th- I think that's going to be great for society. It's going to be great for the global society, not just the United States, because, you know, many of these technologies will, will grow overseas as well. Have you you know, you, you've seen a lot of guys effectively probably start businesses, particularly, let's say, in the shale era. Start that business. You hear about it. They're nobody. And all of a sudden, you know, you watch five or 10 years go by and they built a multi-billion dollar business. And you've seen that over and over again, these founder led sort of businesses. And we saw that in that era of the world. And now you're going to see those same personas, the, the next generation of that. Let's say try to do this in biofuels or CCS or geothermal. Do you notice any sort of traits from the guys that 
that you saw come out and crush it? Are they all wired uniquely, or is there there are a few things you notice? That you are know, it's, it's it's that non it's that never dying spirit within them that says yeah. they can, they can, they can do it, right? And they're going to face hiccups, they're going to face bumps in the road, right? And you know, some of that may be figuring out where the next dollar of capital is. Some of it means. I'm not, I'm not getting paid because I need to put every dollar. I can't. I don't have money. Yeah. To get. And going to the management team and saying, you can't get paid right now. And, uh, but, you know, having that and, and working around the clock, you know, and yeah. finding a group of people that just have it in their sense and their, in their, in their souls that they're going to make this happen. And that's what, you know, you talk to anybody. You, talk, you know, you go back to the Bill Gates' days and, and um, you know, Michael Dell days. And these guys, you know, left school and they built things in the garage and they kept thinking they could, they could, they could. There's all kinds of those sorts of people in the technology world, right? And, and now we're seeing it within our own ecosystem in the energy world. And, you know, the people that leave early. You know, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes these people are making a lot of money where they are, and to just give that up and go do that, sorry, that's why you see a lot of young people do it. They're, they're not giving up a lot to go do that, and yet they're staring at huge gains if they're successful. And right. you, you oftentimes don't hear about the two or three, four play times they failed first, but because they've got that undying spirit, they're going that's on right. to the next one, and they're going to go work on the next one because what they learned in the first two or three that failed – they're, they're not going to make those same mistakes in the next one, and they're going to be successful. They always believe the next one is the one that's going to be hugely successful. It's a it's a beautiful thing. Uh, like we live today in this country, it, you know, the entrepreneurial energy is such that if you keep swinging, you know, on a long enough time horizon, you'll hit. And in worst case, someone's going to hire you. And in fact, uh, like you know, you might be actually more employable going out and taking the risk and failing five times. I think about, you know, if you happen to be successful, very, very rarely on your first tip, you didn't learn a whole lot. No. You, I, would, I would attribute it more to luck than skill. But right. those guys who have gone down the path and had, had failure, have had to cope with that, have had to look at employees in the face and say, we got to lay off or, you know, this is not going to work, et cetera. So thank you for giving me the last three years of your life, you know. But you learn through all the mistakes that had had, and you go on and, and you do things differently the next time. I mean, those people, those people are worth their weight in gold. My uh, my adage when everyone calls and says, "Hey, what should I do about this?" I'm like, just take as much risk as you humanly can tolerate, because the downside scenario is a lot lower than than you think it is. People like that tend to tend to make it eventually, and so it may not it may not be that entrepreneurial startup business they're going to go into, but because they've got that that what I call chutzpah, that, you know, that yep. dying uh, desire to go be successful, they're going to they're going to find success one way or another. That's right. Yeah, in the face of uh, everything else failing, it doesn't matter. It's like that Winston Churchill quote, which is like. Uh, Success is effectively being able to tolerate failure with exuberance, right? Like you just, you ignore it. You can't take it into the next meeting. If you do, like you're, you're guaranteed to fail. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of us would look at the outside and say, you're crazy. What are you doing? And yet <laughs> they're marching down the road. And, and you know, they're, you know I'm, I'm on a couple of these boards where the founders are just absolutely dead set. They're going to find a way one way or another. They don't know where the next nickel is going to come from, but they're going to find it. And they do. And it, takes them to the next step, right? And so, you know, you got to give those these guys a lot of credit. Well, this has been great. I, uh, Steve, I really appreciate this conversation. I think we can go on another hour, uh, <laughs> which, which, you know, like for the audience's benefit, this is like evening time. Uh, so like I, you know, I can't imagine what Steve would be like, uh, you know, 8 a.m. podcast, uh, you know, right, right after a couple of espresso shots. Uh, like you can't listen to this podcast on, on 1.5x. It's not possible. You, got, you had to play get, it on 1x. I get really creative after a couple of margaritas. Then we get really <laughs> then, we, then we get into all kinds. Of, we didn't even get, you know, it's interesting. We went through all this stuff. We went through probably way too much in depth of, of my career and how I got to where I am. But I got all kinds of stories about transactions we worked on and things that happened in these transactions. I, I talk about this and I try to be nameless, but there are some really interesting things that go on in a lot of these deals, or some deals that didn't happen that should have happened, and it mm -hmm. didn't happen because there was somebody, whether it had been an executive a member of, a, uh, of management or a board member, that just wanted to keep that position, their position. It, the economic yeah. proposition for their shareholders was great. It's just, you know what? I'm the CEO, and I want to stay there, or I'm a board member, and I don't want to give up my seat. And, uh, you know, we got you know, we, there's, there's all kinds of interesting stories out there. Do you think that's still happening today that's in the way of a handful of these deals? Look, it's, it's human nature. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I think there is. I know some. I know some personally right now. There's some deals that should, should happen strategically and from a valuation perspective and what the gains would be for shareholders. 
But for one reason or another, and I'm not saying it's necessarily a management or board, it could be other social issues, but they're not, they're not happening. And, right. uh, and they should. But, you know, they, you know, you, you kind of hide behind, well, you know, I got to protect my employees. I got to protect this constituency. You know, it's not right here. It's not the right time. And we've got all this growth in front of us, so we got to get that out first. There's lots of ways to kind of hide behind some of these mm-hmm. things. Uh, but there, there are deals out there that absolutely should happen that aren't happening for, you know, what I'd say non-economic reasons. And, and so, look, some of them are legit. Some of them probably aren't. And, um, you know, I do think that, you know, there, you know, there have been some activists out there, right, that mm-hmm. have forced some deals to happen, right? Um, I, I, think, I think you saw, you know, Kim Ridge in some of these deals. That kind Kendall of, has, uh, has been quite vocal. Yeah. Right? I mean, and look, the shareholder value to be created is almost, you know, they don't get supported if they're not success, if they, if they right. don't have a, uh, a real investment thesis that's going to create value, right? And so, you know, it's not always pleasant when you're, you know, kind of the receiving end of one of their letters and kind of telling you things mm-hmm. to do. Uh, but, you know, you do have to look at these things and say, look, I got a board, I got a management team, we think through this all the time, but do they have a point? Is there something else we could do to create value? Oftentimes, also, I shouldn't say oftentimes, sometimes the activist hasn't thought through of all the you know, unintended consequences of executing what they're suggesting to do in their letters. So sure. management sometimes has other plans, other thing, ways where they're creating value, or know certain things about their business that if they executed some of the plans set forth in a letter from an activist, uh, that has the potential to destroy value, not create value. So, right, yeah. You know, but look, I, I do think we've got a great system going on right now in the energy system. Um, you know, a lot of value to be created. I think it's great for folks in the sector. I think it's great for these companies. I think it's great for America and great for the global society. And uh, you know, what better, you know, I, I just wish, I, I really do wish, you know, that people around the world, particularly people in places that don't come from energy uh, locations, you know, no, Northeast and sure. other places, understood better the economic value and, and what is being created yep. in the energy, but not for energy, right? Yep. None of what we're doing here now, none of what we're wearing, how I got here, how you Doesn't got come. here, transportation, yeah. we couldn't have any of that. We couldn't turn on That's the lights. Right. So if people don't want to think... Think about that. And, and Chuck, uh, Chuck Yates and I have talked ad nauseum about this. You know, here in Oklahoma City, Harold's done a good job of trying to support. Oh, Harold's been fantastic. Yeah. I spent a lot of time, you know, a lot of breakfast brainstorming with folks. Like, you know, what do you do? What can you not do? And the conclusion I've come to is I think the more, uh, let's call it non-anti-oil and gas content. So that is just... You know, it doesn't even have to be pro oil and gas. It's just you know practical about where our energy comes from. Kind of like this conversation, content that exists. There's that's the only thing you could really do because in the absence of all this content, uh, it's just not going to be there, right? And the hope is that ultimately someone who has no idea about energy stumbles upon this audio or a piece of it and says, yeah. "Oh, that's really interesting. I didn't really fully appreciate that. That might be something I want to spend some time and." get to know and then, and then, look there are some guys out there Schellenberger Alex Epstein and he's got his, yep. he's got his energy talking points which is absolutely fantastic you can log it and it really supports you know why we need energy people need yep. to look at these things you can disagree with some of the points but you need to understand what those points are and so you know there's people that spend their you know waking days doing just that and we, and we need those people in in the energy business and I get excited about that too right like everyone talks uh, you know net zero 2050. Yeah, that, that's going to be my entire career, right? So for me, I'm like, well, if we're going to have to transition our entire way of powering the planet while also simultaneously growing energy uh, for, for a long time, you know, what better use of my time or career on this you know, planet is to be in a fun industry like that, right? You know, I, I can think of a lot more boring things to do every day. Absolutely. And, I'm thinking and, about- and look, Rice, you know, I, you, you're, what you're doing here, and I've seen some of your other podcasts, and I'm going to what you said, which is allowing people to talk about it, using it as an education tool for people that maybe don't understand it as well. Yeah. It's fantastic. We need more of that, and kudos to you for you know, taking the time to actually go do that. Well, I appreciate it. And look, it wouldn't be possible if you, you know, guys like you wouldn't come on. So I, I appreciate you coming on. Let's, let's do this. Um, I, cause I feel like we could have a really good follow up here. Let's, let's do the next one. I don't know, six months, 12 months out, try to do it in Cabo and do those two margaritas. We'll bleep out whatever we have to. And, uh, uh, we'll sit you know. by the pool. We'll have more and we'll, we'll talk about good stories. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's make that one a storytelling podcast and, uh, yeah, yeah. Get a little group together. I think it'll be fun. That'd be great. That'd be a lot of fun.
Okay, if uh, anyone wants to reach you that, you know, n- normal channels, what's the best way? You know, LinkedIn, obviously. LinkedIn, you can active. always reach me. I have a lot of people that do that. Uh, Steven.Trauber at Molas.com. Um, look, I- I'm out there. I talk to people all the time. People reach out. I, got, I can't tell you the number of people in school that want to learn uh, about the sectors we're in, right? And they reach out all the time, and I take the time because we were there. We were those people once upon a time. Yep. Somebody did something for us, and I think we all need to learn from that is to reach down and, and help educate folks about the energy industry. They're being told a yep. lot of things that aren't true. We need to be telling people what the truth really is. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable how much of a difference that one conversation might make. Uh, when you're a college kid, you don't know anything about what you want to do and what's out there. And if someone takes the time, that half an hour has the ability to tremendously change someone's career trajectory. And, and for me, I'll tell you this, I would not be in Oklahoma City spending time thinking about the oil and gas industry, spending time thinking about energy transition addition, all these sorts of things. The luxury of getting to visit with guys like you and various other executives and had that great fortune. Had I not been at the... Houston you know, City Energy Group spending time on these sort of categories. I mean, I had no idea. You know, I had a couple of different offers. You know, much like you, I, I had an offer from New York. And uh, my thought was, look, I, I got my, my parents out here in, in Sugar Land. And I said, oh, it will be nice to stay close to family. And uh, they're going to pay the same between New York and Houston. I'll stay in Houston. <laughs> and, and that seemed to be an arbitrary you know, decision. And you know, summered and decided to stay. And so um, I wouldn't be in this industry uh, for, for, without that experience. Absolutely not. Well, so, look, the industry is better for having you in it and for doing what you do. So thank you. It's been, it's been great. I've, I've known you all these years. It's been great to catch up here. And like you said, let's do it again. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Steve. I'll catch you soon. All right. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. How's it going? Bye. Bye-bye.